Hello, friends. So in 2019, I had a vision to tell a story because we were coming up on the 50th anniversary of the War on Cancer Act in 1971. I was steadfast on wanting to tell the stories of the people, you know, n not the medicine, not the disease, not the science, but who were the human beings that broke their asses? Who were the human beings that kicked down doors and forced change? So if you're a narrative history podcast junkie, have a listen to the Cancer Mavericks. Learn how the Black Panthers became breast cancer advocates in the 1970s. How a $250,000 full-page ad in the New York Times shamed the Nixon administration into giving a damn about the people. And how 50 years of social justice movements have brought us to today's conversations about healthcare, health equity, race relations, and all of the crap we have to deal with, again, I think are better problems to have. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Episode 8 of The Cancer Mavericks. And if you haven't experienced it yet, you can now binge all eight episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And off we go. The Cancer Mavericks. A history of survivorship is made possible in part by Amgen Oncology, committed to the relentless pursuit of breakthroughs for cancer patients and their families. The following episode is made possible by GSK. As a science-led global biopharma company, GSK is committed to uniting science, technology, and talent to get ahead of disease together. Find out more at www.gsk.com. Welcome to Episode 8 and the series finale of The Cancer Mavericks, A History of Survivorship. I'm Matthew Zachary. For this episode, we spoke to people who have changed the advocacy world, people who inspire me daily to make a difference, like Dr. Lisa Richardson, Director of the CDC's Division of Cancer Prevention and Control. I think the best advocacy movements are grassroots movements, right? They don't come from the top down. They have to come from the bottom up. And really, this whole survivor um, movement was totally a, a, a grassroots up. Throughout the entire Cancer Maverick series, we've heard the stories of people who laid the groundwork for the cancer advocacy movement. Let's take it back to the very start. Remember Mary Lasker and Rose Kushner from episode one? It was Lasker who first drew attention to President Nixon and Congress, calling for a moonshot for cancer. And Rose Kushner forced doctors to treat breast cancer in an entirely different and far less invasive way. If we think of Mary Lasker back in the 1940s, in, in very kind of male-dominated worlds of science and medicine, Rose Kushner as well in the 1970s, both of these women forged these new paths forward for advocacy in the cancer world. They galvanized the communities together. That's Dr. Catherine Young, Assistant Director of Cancer Moonshot Engagement and Policy at the White House. For someone like myself and others who have been so involved in the advocacy slash activism world and, and cancer to kind of see those points uh, um, come through with these two amazing women um, in the cancer field. Mary Lasker's efforts forced real change. And her legacy continues since President Biden launched the Cancer Moonshot in 2019, the National Cancer Institute has invested over $1 billion in moonshot funding, a milestone in the fight for cancer survivorship. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives underway now, uh, among of which, of course, is the Cancer Moonshot, uh, uh, just one of many uh, through the National Cancer Institute. That's Dr. John Carpton, a chair 
for the Department of Translational Genomics at the University of Southern California Keck School of Medicine. These types of things are long overdue. With us just sort of moving to the other side of the 50-year anniversary uh, for the National Cancer Act and the Declaration of the War on Cancer. As we moved into the 1960s and 1970s, it was incredible to discover that the Black Panthers were opening free clinics and offering breast cancer screenings, filling the gaps left by traditional health care. Again, Dr. Lisa Richardson. In my mind, I was like, wow, that's amazing, because I didn't know that before I listened to the episode. The fact that the uh, Black Panthers were involved at the very beginning, but they also were social justice, working the neighborhood, you know, feeding kids, making sure people had places to stay and live. The Black Panther Party, uh, organization which only been existing since 1966, is opening a health center, and the federal government, with all this wealth and resources, is not doing anything to attack the problem of inadequate health care in, in, in the United States of America. One person can do a lot, and that's the other thing we forget, too, is that one person actually has a lot of power. What discourages us is that problems are so big, when we look at them, we think there's nothing we can do, but what you can do is what you can do in your own life, in your own community, um, in your own neighborhood. One person can make a difference. And sometimes, as we learned in episode six of the Cancer Mavericks, that person can be an international superstar. Cancer Maverick goes to Hollywood. It really brought me to the present um, when I recently saw Mary J. Blige on a Super Bowl commercial speaking to black and brown communities about the importance of mammograms. That's Deanna Darlington. CEO of Links to Equity, a practice that focuses on healthcare equity. Everything looks good. See you next year. See you next year. Thank you. Making your health a priority is real love. Her logic, the science of sure. This was so powerful for me because I know how much she's loved in the black community. I love her. Um, and was inspired by the number of black and brown women who will now go and receive a mammogram because they saw Mary J. Blige do this. If you're 45 and over, listen up tonight. We heard how advocacy took on new forms as culture shifted, such as Chuck D, who brought together advocacy and music. No joke, chill on the alcohol, ease up on the smoke. Realize there's hope, but you gotta catch it early though. Without a health screen, and you won't even know. Get tested. Pay attention to the signs. Talk to your doctor and check your behind. What's coming in and what's coming out. Healthy eating is always the best route. I suggest you talk to your family, your inner circle, and screaming and proactive, and it won't hurt you. We all want to live our lives the best we could be. Go check your colon. Peace, I'm Chuck D. Save lives, save lives. And peace when doctors, patients, caregivers, and advocates pass along information, stories, and advice, they help grow and sustain an informed and inspired community. Chair of Global Health and Purpose, Gil Bash hit the nail on the head. I just like stories, they inspire me. People will say, what, is, what inspires you? I'm just inspired by every story I hear. My story began when the internet was barely a thing. I was 21, it was 1995, and I felt alone in the world. I had no idea I would soon join the next generation of cancer advocates. Advocacy changed my life. Founding and leading Stupid Cancer changed my life. My name is Kenny Kane. I was the chief operating officer at Stupid Cancer from 2010 until 2016. As someone who jumped on the young adult cancer movement a few years into it, it was really interesting to listen to people like Heidi Adams and Doug Ullman, Tamika Felder, Sage Balti, talk about things uh, from the early days, you know, the, the launch, if you will, of the young adult cancer movement. I felt like I was late to the party, not knowing that the party was really just getting started. At Stupid Cancer, we woke up every day to make a difference. Here again is Dr. John Carpton. The privilege to um, uh, attend one of their, their meetings in Las Vegas. I had never seen anything like that before. How alive and how just, you know, they were just 
full of energy and full of life and full of fight. Seeing those young people, uh, how active and, and you know, and, and they were and involved they were um, and, and how passionate they are about this, this, you know, sort of cancer survivorship. Discovering the history of cancer advocacy has left me wondering, what will the future of advocacy look like? Again, Dr. Lisa Richardson. Back in the day, it was newspapers, snail mail. You know, at the beginning of the movement, there was probably not even fax machines, right? So I think the biggest difference of um, today's advocates is the use of social media, being able to connect with people instantly. Um, being able to to grow the movement, you know, f- maybe faster than you could have in the past. Here's Kenny Kane, former chief operating officer of Stupid Cancer. Advocacy will continue to iterate. I think that in the early 2000s, the internet was still figuring itself out. You didn't really have a ton of accessibility from your mobile phone, with the exception of websites. And then we saw mobile apps. We saw the Stupid Cancer app come to fruition, things like that. I think that uh, connectivity will continue to happen. I think it'll be more direct. So I think as cancer advocacy scales, the roadblocks or the limiting factors of connecting with people just like you will be removed. And hopefully it's instantaneous. Here's Catherine Young again. The amplification of these messages and the sharing of stories and the reach touching people that wouldn't have necessarily been touched before in their everyday life. How do we get people who are going along their day and maybe are not touched by cancer in any type of of way, um, how do we get them to care about cancer uh, and maybe those that may in the future be affected by by the disease if they're not currently affected by it. And I think social media is really one way in which you can enter people's lives very easily um, and have them for a brief moment. A new generation of advocates is being passed the torch at a time of great social change. Young people today are more aware than ever of the systemic inequalities that create gaps in our healthcare system. Margaret Laws is president and CEO of Hope Lab, an innovation lab that works on the mental and emotional well-being of young people. I think we're in a a really unique environment where activism among young people has never been this high. Um, Coronavirus, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, the politics of the last several years have really, really engaged young people at a level we haven't seen before. And part of what's allowed them to be as engaged as they are, to organize the way they do, and to advocate as influencers is the prevalence of social media. A young activist can make a difference in the advocacy world just by using their cell phone. Then advances in technology of people being able to organize over the internet, of people being able to form communities with others around the country through technology, and of young people being leaders in technology, figuring out what to do with technology before anybody else does, has has always been an important piece of um, of this movement, and particularly the movement around teen young adult cancer. Technology can also build communities, forging connections that may never have otherwise existed. In the work we do at Hope Lab, to play that same role, to to identify and support all of the magic and the aspirations and the amazing things that we learn about youth activists doing in this Cancer Mavericks episode, and to be thinking about how that's happening today and how we can most effectively support those aspirations, open doors, make connections, provide resources. Here's Catherine Young again. When it comes to podcasts and, and, and social media in general, that ability to touch them at a very singular point is very important. I would say that uh, if you um, recognize that there is a problem or a gap in the system and you are so, and you feel so compelled to do something, that I would want everyone to know that it can be done. Catherine's right. It is inspiring. But as podcasts, websites, and social media become destinations for medical information, there comes responsibility 
says Gil Bash, chair of Global Health and Purpose at Finn Partners. I think that while the technology may evolve and will evolve, I think what needs to evolve in terms of the advocacy community is information and education. Authenticating it, making it easier to understand, using clinical thought leaders as educators so we don't have to re- reinvent the wheel for each patient to give them baseline understanding, and also direct them to authoritative sites. Here again is Dr. John Carpton. I think technology is going to play a huge role. Um, you know, I think we have to be careful with technology as it ensures we utilize these technologies, especially for communication and education. Um, that the right information is being disseminated. But as we take steps forward into unknown territory, we must remember that history is a teacher. It's, it's really helpful and wonderful to learn from history. So I think it's both incredibly inspirational to be reminded of what I just said, that these movements and these stories often start with a very personal story. I think trying to instill that and help young people learn the history of how, how there are inflection points in many activism movements in health and elsewhere that really were started by um, a person in treatment or in care who wanted something to be different and imagined that it could be. A young person might be just crazy enough to believe that something better could happen, and we need that kind of crazy. I remember feeling desperately alone. But the advice my father gave me to do something, anything, not even knowing what that would be, was the catalyst I needed to take that first step. Just be brave and be bold. And the reason that we've made such progress is because the leaders that you've heard throughout the Cancer Mavericks series, they were fearless. You know, they knew, and there was just this inherent, we have nothing to lose. Let's just go and figure it out as we are walking across. And that's what's really allowed us to make the strides that we've made, is that people have been bold and fearless. And I would just say to the new generation of advocates, continue to be bold and fearless as you continue to create the path for the future. If I had a a message to the next me, I would say, keep going. Don't be uh, dissuaded by failures or things that didn't quite work. I think what worked for stupid cancer and what worked for me as I embarked on cancer advocacy was trying everything. Try something new. Try something different. My advice is don't give up. Remind us, of, of those of us who are working in the advocacy world, to always keep patients up front and center in whatever work that you're undertaking because obviously it's their lives at stake. We're always people. We're sometimes patients, but we're always people. This has been Episode 8 and the series finale of The Cancer Mavericks, A History of Survivorship. To hear the whole series, please visit CancerMavericks.com. That's CancerMavericks.com. I'm Matthew Zachary.